everyone, and welcome to this first session of three on the theme of terroir, a complex and infinite notion based on its different makers. I'm Leora Levy, sommelier from Norway, and we will just, before we start, we're just going to launch a survey that you will see appear on the screen, and we would like to know where you come from and in what sphere you work. This poll is open for the next minute. Uh, the seminar is live on Advini Quebec's Facebook uh, page and will be broadcast on the YouTube channel Advini Dif Diffusion or Diffusion. Uh, at my side here, I have uh, Carmen Echeverry, responsible for sustainable development at Advini. And she will be able to interfere, uh, intervene here with her expert um, uh, knowledge on the topics that we cover. So just take a little minute to fill out the poll, please, and we'll be right back with you. Hi, all. Uh, for those who don't know us yet, um, Advini is a French leader of uh, terroir wine. Our vineyard embraces all the know-how uh, in the... Um, uh, hold the know-how in the wine industry on the really beautiful terroir in France and in South Africa. Um, there is a wine heritage of uh, 2,200 hectares in production spread about 20 chateaux. Uh, we all share the same philosophy, the same master word, patient and ambition to preserve and to magnify our terroir. Uh, it's quite natural that the terroir concept bring us together today because we care. For us, it's a complex and infinite notion. We will discuss today with four winemakers who will talk about the specific markers of their terroir from a really iconic region in France. We will therefore talk about the Begadon limestone, which makes us reflect of the choice of uh, vines in the northern part of Medoc, Chateauneuf du Pape and its long geological past, which expressed through a vector de Grenache, of Caor and its terroir mapping to characterize the wine, but not only by this appellation. And finally, the terrace of Larzac and the identity of the domain du Cos d'Arboras, uh, which is grown in a delicate mix between Jurassic limestone, cold climates, and original yeast. Over the next hour, I will take turns asking questions um, to our stakeholders. Uh, all your questions, all your questions can be asked. Uh, on the chat. At the very end, we will answer all your questions. Um, and before we start, I just wanted to thank all the people behind the scenes who made this uh, these webinars happen. So thank you so much to Hélène Dion, uh, Claire Demain, Titienne Lecha, and Julie Pion. Um, you guys will be helping out here while we'll be chatting. So thank you very much in advance. Now, let's welcome our four winemakers who have agreed to spend the next hour with us. Welcome to Lucie Luille, Luille. Oh, I'm very bad at French names, I'm sorry. Luille, mm -hmm. from a director from Chateau Potage d'Eau in Madoc. Uh, welcome to Edouard Guérin, a winemaker of Claude de l'Oratoire de Pape in Chateauneuf. And uh, Julien Touboul, a winemaker and general manager at Régal Cahors. And uh, Mathieu Carlier. Hello. Hi, technical director of the Domaine de Castor Bura, part of the Jean Jean Vineyards in Languedoc. Thank you all for being with us this Monday. And Carmen, maybe you want to um, put in a word about the notion of terroir to begin with. I'd love to, um, because everyone is talking about it, but it's not such a trivial notion. Traditionally, a terroir is a synergy between a plant on one hand and its specific soil and subsoil and the microclimate that surrounds it on the other. It's called the pedoclimate. The know-how of men and women to cultivate this wine in this particular pedoclimate was had to these parameters. People and their know-how uh, are now integrated in the characteristic of terroir. Of course, it may be correlated with the specific and quality, the specificity, pardon, and the quality of wine. So that's for the general definition. We will now see what is the result of all that in our iconic vineyards. So I will open with a question to Edouard. Um, the Clos de l'Oratoire de Pape is part of the AOP Chateauneuf de Pape. Uh, as this designation is the origin of the current AOP system, it has uh, the particularity of giving free reign to uh, great flexibility in the choice of grape varieties. Um, please explain to us how this is positive or negative regarding the transcription of terroir in the glass. 
Yeah, hello. I'm not sure if I understand your question perfectly. You know, it could be sort of politically speaking to say that we are lazy in Chateauneuf du Pape. So <laughs> let's say that we have a light, uh, light rules, that's true. And we can grow a lot of different grape varieties. Commonly, we say that we have 13, but in reality, we have more 18 grape varieties. Um, for me, this is a big chance, and this is signature of Chateau Neuf du Pape, of course. Uh, but this is a good way to reveal the terroir. Just multiplying the grape variety is just adding the grape variety effect to have a better uh, revelation of the soil characteristic. You know, if you have only a single grape variety, you can hide the terroir uh, and have the, the grape variety typicity, the grape variety flavor. Here, we just have much more grape variety that hide the grape variety effect to enhance the terroir. Nice. Well, um, let me ask you next, uh, Julien. Cahors is an appellation with so much diversity and plural, plural characteristics. There is more and more talk of the typology of the different terroirs of Cahors. Can you introduce us to some of these terroirs which unite and also differentiate them? Yes, welcome to the Southwest. At first, we will talk about the geographic situation of Cahors vineyards. It's located midway between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. The vineyard is located between the vineyards of Bordeaux and Languedoc-Roussillon. It extends, uh, we can watch in the map, in the west to Sotiovac and the, the east as far as Cahors. It's a small appellation. Uh, it's uh, 60 kilometers long and 20 kilometers wide. It's a small vineyard, 4,000 hectares planted with uh, 80% of Malbec. The second point, we will talk about the geology and climate of the Cahors vineyards. The Cahors appellation is a Piedmont vineyard. Why? Because it's situated in the foothill of the Massif Central, but it's also close to a river called the Lot. It's an oceanic climate with a temperate climate, white hot, dry summer. We have a variety of soil to get the best out of the complexity of the Malbec profile. There are two many types of terroir. The first terroir is the valley, the terroir of the valley, the terraces of Cahors with a gravelly soil. The lot today, it flows along its riverbed, but 1000 years ago, there were many more fast flowing torrents and the lot curved out these limestone riverbeds and deposited alluvium. 70% of wine from, comes from this part. The second terroir is the terroir of the coast with a clayly limestone. These are Kimmeridgean terroirs. This terroir is on a shallow limestone slab at an altitude of 2050, uh, 250 meters and 300 50 meters above sea level, influenced by the climate and the wind. We find the Kimmeridgean limestone identical to that in Chabli appellation. Uh, there is a photo, a picture which is very interesting. It's the photo with the woods, woods are able to shut out the rock when it's cracked. Uh, it's important because these limestone are extremely cracked due to the tectonic movement of the Massif Central. This enables the woods to export down into the vineyard soils. The deeper the wine woods are able to penetrate, the more the vine will reflect the terroir. Limestone holds water, providing a very well regulated water supply. It's not affected by that by the heat because it can dive deep into the rock. The clay matrix on top explains the density of the vines above. Uh, then to resume, clay limestone produces a higher tannic load because of limited nitrogen supply with mineral aromatic, fresh wine profile, 
with tension and freshness. Wines are dense, powerful, tannic, because of this high production of polyphenol during the cycle. The uh, second terroir is uh, the terroir of the valley. It's the terraces of Cahors. These terraces are the result of several periods of glaciation, deglaciation over the last million of years. The lot was shaped by torrents. The terraces were formed at different times. Wines are less powerful, less dense, but more refined. In this picture, uh, in this photo of terraces, we can see the differences in the porosity of the soil between the three terraces, and it gives different wines. First terrace, very sandy loam, which give a poor water circulation. The second terraces are rich, richer in clay with pebbles, and it gives wine with a more structure. In the first terraces, there are siliceous clay soils in the lower part and stony limestone soil in the upper part. It's near the coast. Wine products are powerful and have a distinction generous fruitness, while the wines on the screen have more finesse. To resume, this part in the valley, uh, gravely soil products more explosive, gourmand free, ripper because the soils cause them to weapon earlier with tannin, less present and more delicate because of water constraints that help to weapon this tannin. It gives wines more fleshly, fleshy and round with a beautiful elegance. And then uh, the topography has a great impact. The influences of altitude in the river load allow for a slower maturity and for more aromatic complexity on the plateau. Okay, thank you so much, Julia. I can I bet that lots of those people who are watching did not know about the Kimmeridgian soil in the, in the Cahors. So absolutely interesting information and also to see so many different type soil depending on the altitude. Um, Lucy, over to you. The Madoc has many peculiarities and diverse terroirs as well. And we find these uh, subtleties very uh, particular to Patage d'eau. Can you tell us about your main terroirs and their characteristics? Yeah, uh, first, the first characteristic of maybe the terroir of Patage d'eau is the climate, the climate, uh, because Patage d'eau is located in the, nor the northmost part of Medoc, uh, with the proximity of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gironde River, influencing water regime and temperature and resulting in the humid, humid climate. We have a, a wetter and later climate than the rest of Bordeaux. And it results a significant lateness in the style of the wine uh, and explain partly the freshness of the Patage d'eau style. The second characteristic of the terroir is the soil. Uh, the 58 hectares of Chateau Patage d'eau is located um, uh, on two sites 10 kilometers apart. And we can define three types of soil uh, with different characteristics on wine style. Uh, we have one part uh, with 48 hectares is located on the limestone plateau with two types of soil. The first one is a very superficial hard limestone with a very slightly fracture with a clay thickness surface. Uh, so on this soil, water and nitrogen level are very well controlled, working out like a drip with no important water pressure and moderates uh, during an important dry, dry period. Uh, the profile of the grape of the wine is sophisticated with a high freshness giving a certain longer uh, length. The second uh, one, um, second one uh, soil in this plot uh, is on profound clay, li limestone clay. Uh, creating, creating an important mechanic constraint on the rooting system by swelling and shrinking of the clay uh, between dry and humid period, working like a sponge. Uh, what are the consequences uh, of that? We have a high nit nitrogen restriction on this soil involving uh, a, um, a vine stress 
and setting and setting off secondary metabolism being at the origin of the synthesis of polyphenol. And it results on this type of soil, we have a, a strong, massive, a tannic and deep color wine. And finally, the third soil, terroir, uh, we, we have on Chateau Patage d'eau is located on the river on the river side, established on gravel soil. So we have a sandy clay soil with a high proportion of gravel. And it's resulting on it, we have a high level of nitrogen if not re regu regulated by controlled grassing. And we have a holy water pressure during the cycle and a very important water pressure during uh, dry summer season. So on this soil, uh, we have a holy harvest and it results on it, uh, we obtain wine more deli uh, delicate with a lot of fruit, red and black ripe fruit aroma and uh, moderate and refined tannins. Thank you, Lucy. Well, I think that many with me uh, find these uh, pictures of soil pits very interesting. You really understand how the soil is composed much better when you can see it in a picture like that while you're explained. So thank you very much, Lucy. Um, over to you, Mathieu. And uh, down in the Languedoc, uh, we are going to uh, Domaine de Castarbora, uh, which is located in the AOP Terrasses de Larsac. Uh, an appellation that was created relatively recently, back in 2013. However, its situation on a COS um, stands out in several aspects, including its soil and basement. Explain to us the different differentiations that make its geological identity. The climate being involved in the notion of terroir, okay. while the majority of Languedoc is under maritime influence. Um, Yes, so um, you know that in Languedoc we have uh, uh, a big problem, which is uh, heat and dryness. So I will mainly focus on um, uh, what are the main uh, two ideas on the Coast d'Arboras, um, viewing that two that problem of heat and dryness. Okay, first of all, uh, the geological um, history. Here on the coast d'Arboras, we are on a big uh, plateau, a limestone plateau, which has been uh, formed uh, 150 million years ago in the Jurassic era during the, the dinosaur's reign on Earth. So uh, this, block, this block of limestone has been uh, fractured, has been, has been broken by uh, the difference of uh, cold periods and hot periods. So uh, you have now big, big faults going very deep in the soil, as you can see on the drawer here. Uh, these uh, faults allow the vines to uh, send their roots very deep in the soil uh, to get uh, water and nutrients that the, the vine needs. Of course, in a small quantity, but always in the year, and especially uh, during the summer when it's very hot and dry. Okay, so this is the first point, limestone block with big faults. Then the climate. Here we are on a pretty high altitude, which is 320 meters, which is not that high, but for Languedoc vineyard, it's pretty high. Eh? It's one of the most higher, uh, vineyard in the Languedoc. So that's very important because that uh, uh, brings a difference of temperatures between, uh, between night and days, uh, which allow uh, the maturation uh, of the grapes. For example, during uh, August uh, time, uh, in the valley, down in the valley, uh, the night temperatures are roughly between uh, 15 and 17 degrees Celsius. And on the course, on the course d'Arboras, on the plateau, sorry, we are, we are at uh, roughly 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you see the difference, at least five degrees uh, Celsius between the valley and the, the course d'Arboras. So this is very important because that allows uh, the grapes to really uh, gently mature 
to reach uh, an optimum of uh, maturation uh, to have a uh, nice wine. And, wh and when I say nice wine, I say very uh, pure and intense aromas, very fine and delicate tannins with a nice uh, stuff uh, structure. Okay, so two elements, okay, geological, the, the, the limestone with the fault, and the altitude, 320 meters. But you also have something to tell us about climate and um, harvesting later and things like that, because that's yeah. also very important right now. Yes, because due, due to this uh, climate, due to this uh, altitude and also the proximity of uh, the Larzac Plateau, which uh, is uh, roughly 1000 meter high, okay, we have very cold winds, especially uh, starting middle of August and September. We have very cold winds, which create like a natural cooling system, if you want, okay, and that really uh, allows us again to push the maturation. Uh, very, uh, very um, to the optimum. And there is a difference uh, of 15 days uh, of, uh, if we see, the, if we look at the date of harvesting, we have a 15 day difference between the valley and the, and the coast d'Arboras. So we can keep freshness, the freshness of the fruit, but the ripeness of the, of the tannins. Very nice. Well, it was good with the aerial pictures also because you say that there are quite big difference between uh, the yes. coast and down in the valley floor, but there are really a lot of these crevices. Um, well, you have a lot of uh, sun and uh, warm weather. Uh, you might want to send some of that up to Norway because it's pretty cold here <laughs> and will be for quite a quite a long time. <laughs> uh, we're going to move over to Edouard. Um, at the Clos, we have been, you, or you have been studying for years now, the four geological periods that make up the soils of the Chateauneuf du Pape Appellation. And um, would you tell us about the steps that were put forward to understand the differences in soil uh, of the AOC and how they translate into wine? Yes, uh, Chateau du Pape is, is a large appellation, you know, it's around, three, it's over 3,000 hectares. So on 3,000 hectares, we uh, described four great kind of soil. Uh, we have the galley roulé, of course, you know, this cobblestone. Yes, I always have stone with me. Uh, this kind of stone, we have nice pictures now with bush vine on it. And this, this is one of the most traditional, what you expect to see when you're in Chateauneuf. But we also have some sandstone, which is a very different one, sort of uh, sand, which has been agglomerated. And we also have limestone, what we see on the photo now. Uh, uh, so it's a white limestone with very, uh, with very sharp uh, pieces here. Each kind of this soil gives a typicity, but to understand which typicity it gives to the wine, we made sort of experiments and we did it several times. We just selected some Grenache 100% Grenache on each of this, so this soil. We uh, vinify them separately, we age them separately, and we bottle them. So it means that we have only Grenache from Chateauneuf du Pape, from the same vintage, but the only difference is just the soil where the grapes have been are grown. So we have a strong impact of the soil into the wine and we can really taste it. Yora, we, you already made this tasting. We did it together and you, you can remember. And each soil really gives it its own typicity. On the limestone, we will find a bit of um, sort of minerality uh, on nose and very sharp tannins. You know, the stone is quite sharp and we also have sharp tannins. It's very interesting to compare the tannin stru structure to uh, the stone where the grapes grown. On the sandstone, it's hard to see now, uh, but you can imagine if I just put my tongue on the stone, it's very sticky. Uh, and we will have very sticky tannin as well. Go for Grenache growth on this kind of soil. On the cobblestone, on the galerie, you know, that's where we have the biggest wine with very round tannin, a lot of generosity into the wine, like this stone is. 
very wrong. And when you move to the sand, because there is a part of sandstone sand in Chateau Neuf du Pape, uh, we call it safre. We have very sandy tannin. Imagine some uh, sand going through your finger. The tannins make exactly the same sensation in mass, a thin grain of tannin, a lot of elegance. So each soil has its all, own identity and that really helped us to understand it, to make the wine and to, to, to walk separately into the vineyard. Well, thank you, uh, Edouard. You're making me thirsty. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I must say that I've been lucky enough to, to try these wines. And it is really amazing how you can actually feel the difference in terroir when everything else is exactly the same. Um, and uh, even though I think the Galer Ouellet, I, I love the wines coming from there. And I also think it's one of the most beautiful uh, types of soil you can see. It's probably the worst ever to uh, harvest in. But uh, maybe you can shed some more light on this, Carmen. Yes, yeah, so we have so all the richness and diversity of the pyroclimates in our great terroir. Thank you all, it was really interesting. But these particularities, however exceptional, uh, could have been ignored if women and men, through a slow and meticulous and pre-recall process, have not revealed them. So for Havigny, a great terroir, it's of course an exceptional pedoclimatic potential, as we've seen, uh, but it's also, and above all, what we do with all that. Um, we'll be interested in the choice of our winemakers, whose mission, not simple, it's to preserve and magnify our terroir. And uh, Lucy, um, for your choice of green material, for you, a choice of green material is very crucial uh, for an optimal expression of the terroir. Uh, you bet on the ad adequacy between your soil, your microclimate, and your plant, obviously. Uh, for this, you're working on the evolution of your vine. Can you tell us about your achievements and your projects? Yeah. Uh, first, um, I need to explain a little the history of this area. Um, Medoc history is strongly ensured in Cabernet Sauvignon, influenced by, by the established Grand Cru Classé in the left bank on gravel soil bordering the Gironde. And in the uh, 80s, we can ob observe uh, a, an important introduction of Merlot in various places, places giving a more generous yields and a more re, uh, reliable aromatic profile so that the maturity uh, was sure every year. And we can see this history in, in Patage d'eau vineyards. We have very old Cabernet Sauvignon, 80 years old, planting, planting on the limestone plateau and uh, 20 to uh, 30 years old Merlot established on gravel soil um, and it, it results during our beginning uh, purchase an important restructuration uh, at Chateau Patage d'eau. Um, first uh, we are started to plant uh, by planting Cabernet Sauvignon on gravel soil. Uh, why? Because uh, this type of, of grape varieties uh, have a late profile and require uh, water pressure to refine the tannins. After we, we, we choose to remove of Cabernet Sauvignon on deep limestone clay soil due to its complicated maturity in late and rainy vintage um, at harvest time. So we introduce Merlot graft on little productive rootstock. And then uh, on superficial rock base limestone, we have a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon now, and we choose to introduce now Cabernet Franc grapes. Uh, it's a king of the rights bank. Uh, the Cabernet Franc does not cope with water stress and must be constrained when it's come to nitrogen. So effectively in Chateau Patage d'eau, Patage d'eau will move on different style in the coming years. Uh, today we have 60% of Cabernet Sauvignon, which is very influencing on the wine. And maybe in 10 years, uh, not tomorrow, but in 10 years, we have an evolution with less Cabernet Sauvignon, 30, 40% and more Cabernet Franc. So the style will change. Then um, in Bordeaux, we 
always speak about uh, Petit Verdot. It's a very interesting grape varieties by its powerful characters. But I think it's not necessary at Patache because we already have soil producing powerful wine. So we have decided to keep 3% for tradition. Uh, and it's a little, it's interesting, but we just, we don't choose to um, have more Petit Verdot. And finally, uh, we choose to introduce a little proportion of Malbec. Why? Because on the rock base clay soil, uh, Julien explained uh, very well, uh, when stressed, Malbec uh, grape bring a strong spicy style with not of violet um, and uh, can bring a lot of complexity of, on our wine. And on the deep soil, uh, Malbec uh, bring colors to our second wine and uh, a pleasant fruity characters. So we choose to introduce uh, a little bit of Malbec. Thank you, Lucy. And I think uh, all of you are right when, when you talk about the different grape varieties and especially when you have so many to choose from in Chateauneuf, but also in Bordeaux and in the Languedoc. So um, especially with climate change today, it's just super important to, to be able to blend so that you can continue making these wines the way we know them. Um, to you, Julien, uh, to express itself to the fullest of its potential, each of the Cahors terroirs require a care of its own. Uh, this is especially true for winemaking. Can you explain to us how uh, or what changes in your practices in the cellar uh, when you work on a third terrace, uh, Pierre Blanche or uh, Terre Rouge Cuvée? Yes. <clears throat> Third terraces comes from the Valais of Cahors and Pierre Blanche and Terre Rouge comes from the Cos. Regal enables you to explore the subtleties of the Cahors wine region with the three exceptional wines. The same grapes variety have been used on three different top quality terroirs in order to create three very fine wines. The key point is the date of the grape harvest. Vines in the valley will reach peak maturity earlier than those on the plateau. Maturity are staggered. The technological and phenolic maturity of the grapes differs according to the type of soils. The work done in the wine cellar should allow the terroir to show folk. At first for clayly limestone, the grape have many tannins because of the high production of polyphenol. We will adapt the vinification. Vinification temperature higher than 26 degrees in order to extract tannin, which are reaper, but not more than 30 degrees to avoid vegetal tannins from the pipes. Junkler extraction from your very structured, very tannic grape profile. And we will use long maceration in vats for your more rustic profiles with the polymerization of the polyphenol to wound of the tannin. For the gravely soils, for soils that produce very fruity wine profile, we will use cold maceration and low fermentation temperature. We extract very early and very hard to get the color and tannin very quickly, then stop the extraction to limit the extraction of tannin from the pipes. Very nice. Um, Edouard, maybe you can explain to us how this understanding of the four terroirs modulates the way that you work in the vineyard and in the cellar. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when you know, as Julien just explained uh, before me, when you know the, the typicity of the wine that your soil is able to, to give, you know, each soil will give really a strong typicity when you know it, when you understand it, when you are able to extract it, you can just go further and blend them, blend them very early to co-ferment grape varieties, of course, but also co-ferment different terroirs. This was particularly useful this year in 2020. 2020 is um, a bit light in terms of tan tannin and then more structure. Uh, in most of the, the, the Grenache in Chateauneuf-du-Pape. So blending some galerule, which bring structure, 
with some soft soil, which are much more elegant, much more fine, was very interesting in vinification very early that helped to stabilize the wine. And then when we can go a bit further, we will see that also on the sandy soil, we had a very good maturity of the stems. And so this year, a whole bunch of fermentation was very interesting also to bring some structure. Uh, the last things we, we, we harvested this year were 100% with whole bunches, 100% with stems. So that was very interesting. That was just nice, nice tool to play between the soils, the gravities, and also the stems to have the best expression of Chateau Neuf du Pape. This is what we tried to do. Well, I think you're doing quite well on it. So good. <laughs> um, I have some questions for Mathieu. Um, a key element of the transmission of the terroir in the glass um, is a microscopic is at a microscopic level. The yeast that we find in the specific place, can you tell us about the original yeast project and the studies you've done? Yes, of course. Um, we have been uh, thinking uh, since a long time now with uh, all the team of Vigneuve Jean Jean of uh, how to uh, to really uh, make uh, authentic and uh, terroir wine. So uh, one of the one of the answer was uh, uh, the, the the fermentation um, stage and of course the yeast. What were the yeast that were fermenting in the vat? So uh, we uh, we said that. Uh, why not uh, train the yeast that are on the on the grapes on the on the estate? So we have been uh, going uh, in the vineyards to uh, to uh, to take some grapes to harvest some grapes before uh, harvest before harvest. Yes, and we have been selecting the yeast. We have been looking at them and try to figure out what was the difference between the yeast that we can find. Uh, I mean, uh, somewhere else, you know, the, when the, the, the big uh, yeast makers that can sell you uh, or, and the yeast that were really um, uh, unique to the, to, the, to, the, to the domain du Cos d'Arbois. So uh, we have been uh, looking at that and we, we, we noticed that uh, uh, maybe we, we have seen maybe uh, 20 different types of yeast. 80% of them were already uh, I sold, you know, as a commercial yeast, and only 20% were really unique. Okay, this uh, you see on the screen is a PCR uh, polymerase chain reaction, where you can look at the different uh, DNA uh, type of the yeast, and by that uh, technique, we can really see what uh, were, what are the yeast specific to the to the domain to the domain du Cos d'Arbois. So um, since now six vinification, six vintage, we, uh, we are using only the yeast that are grown on the domain, on the domain du Cos d'Arbois, which uh, really what we can call them original yeast or indigen yeast, but I prefer original yeast uh, for that, uh, for that uh, in that case. Okay, well, I must say that uh, a picture like that is uh, quite new to me, and I, I think I'm going to need some more help reading it <laughs> at some yes. point. But um, based on these analytics uh, or mm -hmm. ana this analysis, um, where the aromatic compounds differ uh, between mm -hmm. a wine made with a commercial yeast and the wine with the original, I'm happy to use the word original. I think indigenous is very difficult to pronounce anyway. Um, so, what was your, what's your? Yes, they, they, uh, there are two levels. We, we have been uh, making a, a study uh, two years ago. Uh, so the results are two levels. First level, uh, the general uh, volatile components like uh, superior alcohols, like ester, like acids. Okay, we don't see many differences. Okay, uh, between the commercial yeast and the yeast from the domain du Cos d'Arbois. But if we go uh, into the, uh, the organolytic uh, perception, here we, we see lots of difference, uh, especially in terms of uh, fruit, fruitness, okay, fruit, uh, especially on the black fruit character, which is really more intense 
with uh, with uh, original yeast, and the spicy notes are also more uh, accurate with um, with original yeast. But that's not the main point. The thing is that we have uh, we have been uh, uh, making some different juries uh, with professional and non-professional uh, taster to uh, to try to see if we can see a difference between the the, the wine made with uh, commercial yeast and the wine made with uh, original yeast. And we have uh, noticed at that stage that the wine made with the original yeast is always preferred to the other one because of a global harmony, global balance, which is uh, really uh, um, really uh, accurate with the uh, original yeast. Okay, so it's not only a question of more. Uh, of uh, that or that aromas, it's really a question of global feeling, global balance that you have when you taste when you taste the wines. Wow, I must say that that sounds like a very ex exciting tasting, yes. and uh, I I'd love to join that tasting whenever you. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Carmen, when, when the country will will uh, will be open, when you can go in, <laughs> you're welcome, of course, anytime. Good. Can't wait for that, Carmen. Let's yes talk some more about this terroir thing. Yes, the specification of the appellations are like a guarantee uh, to respect uh, of respect for the fundamentals of each terroir, uh, as we have seen in all these presentations. Um, they have helped to ensure, to be credible and to spread this notion. Uh, but the terroir is not a fixed notion. It's not a fixed notion. Uh, it's a part of a systemic, holistic, and transdisciplinary approach uh, to how we produce wine. The world is changing, as we've seen, the social expectations are changing, uh, even the biophysical characteristic of our plots will change. Uh, you speak to Yora about the climate change. Um, faced with all this, our approach of to viticulture, winemaking, and the lightening up of the terroir also evolves in Avigny. Our winemakers face many problems, and so they are forced to innovate. Well, I think that's um, probably not only in France, but in many parts of the world. Mm, Lucy, we often talk about the um, uh, patache spine. Can you explain what it means and how you build the balance of a patache wine? Yeah, um, the, we have a, a diversity of, ter of soil. Uh, and so the grape are very different from one another. So this requires require to especially adapt our winemaking accordingly to the type of wine we are looking for uh, and the climate changement uh, is very important now. So working on the patash spine means that we have researched the best expression of each terroir and the complementarity of each other to make uh, a bottle reveal the diversity of the terroir. Uh, first, uh, most plot, most part of patash do uh, is located on limestone and clay soil. So Patage d'eau have naturally a powerful and dense style. So um, for this type of grape uh, on, on the vineyard uh, for the harvest, uh, we let the grape maximum of time outside and in order to permit a good maturity of the tannins. Because on this soil, we have massive tannins we still need to run them safe um, before people wait to drink uh, to drink a, a bottle of Bordeaux. Now they want to drink very fast, so the tannins need to be ripe. Uh, so we we let uh, outside um, um, very late, maybe half of October here, and in the vinification we evolved. Um, we work with very soft extraction on this type of rape uh, and to no none, none at all for the Cabernet Sauvignon we use infusion and when you have we, uh, we extract on Merlot 
we use punching down only one to two during the winemaking just to extract the tannins and bring roundness and softness. And uh, our vinification permit to limit reactive and peps tannins. Uh, we choose uh, to reduce maceration times, uh, not to end up with a too powerful uh, profile. And we choose to maturing in barrels, uh, the aging is done in barrels uh, to refine the tannins because massive tannins needs time uh, in barrels. And a little part of patage d'eau is located on gravel soil, maybe 20 percent. So in this soil, um, we, we are seeking to bring fresh fruit and lightness. Uh, so we, we do a early harvest, uh, maybe best, before most of time in, in, the, in the area. And we do a cold prefermentary uh, to bring fruit. Uh, the extraction is very soft by punching down and pumping over at quite low temperature. And, the, and we use a short maceration on it. Uh, the aim is to have a light profile, short and on fresh fruit. And the maturation is done in concrete tank. Uh, with the climate evolution, uh, climate evolution, uh, the alcoholic degree is higher. So we test with talk, like in Valley du Rhone, uh, and we have very interesting uh, results in the aromatic and freshness point of view. So we have research on uh, in Patage de wine making uh, to that the, the wine um, wine which keep the density of its terroir built on freshness and structure while bringing around and generous character from the gravel soil. Making wine is like a puzzle, isn't it? I mean, you have all these different plots and you have many different grape varieties and well, people who make wine, they must love puzzles, I think, because there's so much you can do here. And um, what you say, Lucy, is also very important that people don't wait with drinking wine, the, unfortunately, uh, but uh, most, at least in Norway, they made a survey where when people go to the shop to buy wine, uh, most of the time, all wine that's bought is consumed within four hours. So uh, not aging. It's quite the same in France. Yeah, exactly. But um, let's see here, Mathieu, finally, your job makes you think beyond a um, purely calculated and clinical relationship of wine with its environment. Would you say that there's an elusive part? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, uh, uh, since a long time, uh, we are now we are facing uh, different problems in the vineyards uh, that Techniques that uh, actual techniques uh, cannot cannot solve. We we are now um, arriving at a point where uh, I have uh, many problems you know, to, to to really solve solve uh, uh, the, the, the the vineyards problem with uh, with the, the techniques that uh, I have now. So uh, I'm uh, now more looking for. Uh, um, uh, for uh, using really the potential of the of the of the estate, and uh, using less and less uh, products or uh, techniques from outside, and that means that I have to believe on the, on the global uh, interactions of the different elements on the estate. Uh, and that might be very, uh, as you said, elusive because this is something that, of course, you cannot see, uh, and you can only, uh, let's say, try to uh, to uh, to improve those interactions and to uh, to see how they they, they finally um, are in the wines. So that's why, for example, we started uh, biodynamic uh, uh, techniques. On the Coast d'Arboras, domain du Coast d'Arboras, because for me uh, that's a good uh, uh, theory. Let's say today to uh, try to have that all that components, you know, uh, 
soil, subsoil, soil, the, the plant itself, and climate, and all the different forces uh, working together to go towards something uh, um, which is for us uh, more expressive uh, in uh, in the in the wines. So that's that's a long way, of course, but uh, but I'm 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 uh, positive on that uh, on, on that uh, way of uh, of working now. Good. Well, if there's anything we need these days, it's positivity. So yes. <laughs> that's good. Uh, before we conclude and go to the questions, uh, I would like to uh, I would like all the four of you to present a wine that is representative of your working philosophy and um, this will be like just really quickly so in less than a minute. Uh, Lucy, let's start with you. Can you, hear can you repeat? Uh, I didn't oh, No, I said um, we would like you to present a wine that is representative of your working philosophy in less than a minute. So just really quickly, what's the wine that you really find represents your working philosophy? I, I, I don't heard. So oh, you have you have a, maybe a little yeah. bit of a bad connection here. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll uh, wait with you and uh, we'll ask the others first, and then hopefully your connection is better when we come back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Edouard, one uh, short one on the wine that really shows off your work philosophy. A short word. Oh, short, yeah. Serious? <laughs> we work over one year to produce some wine and you want less than one minute to speak about it. Okay, I will try to be very brief. So Claude Laratoire des Papes or uh, Red Chateauneuf du Pape is definitely what we try to do. Expression of the terroir, a blend of each terroir and variety, of course, dominated by the Grenache, but we have a touch of Galerule, a touch of Safre, a touch of limestone, a little bit of everything, and the wine must be drank um, quite young, must be really young, but can also be aged. And that must be, of course, paired with food. So it's not this kind of bodybuilded uh, Chateau Neuf du Pape, but just, you know, the elegance and the pleasure that you have to drink. So yeah, cheers. I saw, cheers. I saw that you were already quite far down into that bottle. Enjoy. <laughs> what about you, Mathieu? What is your preferred uh, wine representing your working philosophy? Uh, this is a wine, of course, from Domaine du Cos d'Arboras. It's called uh, L'Autochtone. This is a pure uh, Sasso. Uh, and this uh, uh, is... Um, the wine that we have made with no entrant, okay, at all. So uh, uh, it's um, no sulfites, fermented with uh, original yeast, as I uh, explained before. Uh, so this is really the type of wine now I want to 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 make on the different uh, estate and especially on the on the domain du Cos d'Arboras, which is really close to the fruit, to the, really to the, the nature of the fruit. Uh, and uh, with uh, also the, 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 the varieties that are really coming, uh, historically coming from the area. And the saint uh, is really uh, one of the, of the fourth uh, original varieties of Languedoc. And that's uh, also a way that we want to, uh, to explore now uh, with the very old varieties, historical varieties on historical uh, soils. So, Very nice. Because I've been, Arboras, l'autochtone. I've been lucky enough to taste that wine. And I yes. think uh, I think there should be more pure Sansos because it's a grape that deserves to be shown all by itself as well, not always as a blend. Um, Lucy, how is your connection? Is it better now? Good. So uh, please tell us uh, which wine is your go-to wine showing off your working for solo, for love, philosophy. <laughs> yeah. So no surprise, it's Chateau Patajo. I speak about <laughs> since the beginning. Uh, it's the vintage uh, 16, sorry, can't see. Um, it's maybe one, one of the best uh, vintage since maybe 20 years because of the, the weather was very just perfect, produce uh, quality and quantity. So um, maybe the challenge this year, this year in 2016, um, was to be careful with the powerful um, of this potential wine. We have to handle this powerful wine with care. So 
this wine denotes show complexity in the aroma with combination of red and black fruit and very marked uh, minty characters. And the mouth is dense and large with a very long and uh, the final still a little bit tight because the wine is very young. Um, uh, maybe this wine needs putting in the decanter before being put on the table now. Uh, it's, um, it's a young wine which has a long potential aging. You, you say people don't wait to drink a bottle, but maybe Patage du 16, uh, it's better to wait two, four years. Okay, so good to, uh, to note uh, for all of you watching 2016 vintage of Patash Do. Drink it now or within a couple of years or wait a couple of years, up to you. What about you, you Julien? Which one is your go-to wine showing off your philosophy? It's the black wine. Oh. The Van Noir is not just a legend. It's a unique and refined black wine made for Malbec wines perfect for enjoying with good food. It's come from the misty vineyards of the Lot Valley. It was famous for its intensity and this full group Europe in the 18th century. The secret of the black wines of Cahors has always been closely guarded. The wine style, it's a strong dark hue. The wine shows superb aromatic intensity when uh, first nosed. On the second nosing, it reveals notes of jammy black fruits, nicely complemented by floral, violet-like overtones. The constant contact of the wine with the wood during vinification has created an harmonious balance between the oak and the aromatic complexity on the, of the wine on the palette. And it's very important, the tannin are particularly uh, well dirty and uh, reveal themselves in a refined, uh, simple manner. Thanks. Nice, that sounds uh, delicious. And uh, I don't know, it looks like you have some company down there in, uh, in uh, the Southwest, do you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see that there was someone sneaking into your picture. <laughs> um, let's see if you get some more company by the end of the session. Uh, we're going to go to the questions, but I just want one punchline from each of you. Um, Julien, what is it that you love about Malbec? I love to, reveal the, to reveal the diversity of Malbec for profile on the different soil. Uh, we talked about the two parts uh, of Cahors, but really there are nine characteristic terroirs uh, in Cahors. For example, very quickly, in the valley, the fur terraces, gravel soils, reveal sensual and uh, elegant wine. But in the coast, with the Cameridian limestone, uh, it reveals mineral wine. And then in the plateau, uh, the wet soils give us intense and rich wine. Wow, that must have been the longest sentence ever. But at least you really expressed uh, why we should try more of the Malbecs from Cahors so that we can actually taste the differences uh, depending on the terroir. Um, Lucy, one sentence to you. Why do you want it? Why did you choose to work with Bordeaux wines? Oh, okay. First, because the region is very pleasant to live. <laughs> no, I'm from south of France, close to Bordeaux. But maybe because make one in Bordeaux is a challenge every day is on the vineyard, on the cellar. Make one in Bordeaux request maybe a very specific understanding of the association between soil, grape varieties, and the profound adaptation to the climate management. <laughs> True. And um, Mathieu, in one sentence, do you think that wine critics like Jancis Robinson and Andrew Jefford have helped wine lovers understanding to understand the amazing quality of the wines of the south of France, seeing that they both have uh, strong connections to the area? Mm, yes, <laughs> but I think uh, most of, more of that is that it's that the quality is really the quality of the Languedoc wines is really nice and. Especially with uh, on the vineyard Jean Jean, we are really uh, 
working uh, towards uh, uh, some work that we call the bright wines. Okay, this is really our credo. Bright wines, that mean wines that are uh, intense, uh, aromatic, uh, and also with a nice, elegant and fine ending, you know, and this is, uh, this is really our, our credo, bright wines. Nice. And Edouard, one sentence, which of the four main soil types of the Chateauneuf de Pape gives the expression that you favor most in the wine? Oh, probably the sap, the sandy soil. That's where we find the most fine wine, the, 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 the yeah, very elegant, the most feminine wine in the appellation. So you thought that I was try to answer in one sentence, but you know that's impossible with me. <laughs> Uh, we've come to an end a little bit. Um, Carmen, uh, maybe you have a few yeah. words uh, to conclude before we go to the questions? Yeah, sure. Well, have you seen the notion of terroir is really complex and infinite? I think we could have discussed for hours. Our philosophy at Advini is based on two pillars, to preserve and to magnify our terroirs. Preserving means combating everything that could be a threat for our soils, soil erosion, climate change, bio biodiversity collapse, uh, which is why we are absolutely committed to the agroecological transition in our vineyards. Uh, if you want to know more about this team, I invite you to watch the next webinar next week. We will discuss this topic. And Manify, it's really the idea uh, of this constant search for an improvement of the quality and the typicity of our wines. We never rest on our laurels, as you have seen. We continue this path, evolution and innovation. Well, uh, thank you, Carmen. And uh, now uh, all these great gals behind the scenes, they've compiled the questions. So uh, thank you, uh, Hélène and, uh, and uh, Julie and uh, all the other ladies, um, we have some questions. So the first question, um, it's basically whoever wants to, to answer this question. Um, the degustation word minerality is often used to describe a wine, even a wine that comes from different terroirs. How do you connect the word minerality to a kind of terroir? Tricky one. Anyone wants to volunteer to answer that? I I mean, I use the word minerality when I spoke about the limestone. Uh, I will not give a long answer and, and full answer. I will just bring a part of the answer <laughs> because I don't have the, the whole answer. Uh, in Chateauneuf du Pape, on the limestone soil, we have sort of mineralities that we find into the wine. It's particularly true on the white. Wine. So white, white, white Chateauneuf of the Pape that we make from the limestone soil are just signed by a minerality, a saltiness. And when you have a white wine where you find this sal salty finish in Chateauneuf of the Pape, you can be sure that it comes from uh, the limestone. And I should say that I find it also in some Chablis sometimes. And on the limestone soil, we find this saltiness. And for me, there is a link between the limestone and the salt. It's always tricky to talk about minerality in wine. I had a discussion with a geologist uh, sometimes, and it's uh, it can go on forever. So well done on keeping it short, uh, Edouard, and a uh, uh, good answer for that. Um, Mathieu, I know you have to leave us very shortly, so I'm going to uh, direct the next question to you here. Uh, did you find the original uncertain uh, grapes um, or only or, or on all of them? Uh, uh, you, you mean uh, different um, grape varieties? Yes, different. Ah, okay. or it, was it certain grape varieties or was it all the grape varieties that show differences in the origin, uh, original yeast? Mm, not really. It did not, uh, doesn't depend on grape varieties. It's really uh, look. It's really connected to uh, to the plots uh, in the vineyard. But for example, uh, two uh, uh, different plots of Grenache uh, can have different types of uh, of, uh, of yeasts. But the the the, the base. I mean, uh, seventy percent of the of the yeast. Uh, we find them on every on every box and every types of uh, of um, grape varieties. 
Okay. Uh, the, the diversity is more from vint a vintage to another vintage. That means on the, on the same year, for example, you will have uh, mostly the same uh, types of uh, yeast on different plots, but the year after, 80% of the yeast will be different than the year before. It's really, the difference is more from vintage to vintage than from block to blocks. Okay, so this is a very interesting because depending on the year, uh, you will have more of that type of yeast because of the humidity, because of the sun, because of the different, uh, uh, you know, uh, different um, elements from the environment. Uh, but you will find them everywhere in the in the domain. Okay, okay. saying that the domain du Cos d'Arboras is on one block, so there are the, the the different plots are very close to each other. So maybe that explains that you that we can find the same yeast everywhere on the on the spot. Maybe if we had different uh, plots, you know, uh, separated from uh, from. Um, from uh, different miles or kilometers, it would be different. But as we are on the same block, uh, we have the same yeast, but they are, the, the variety, as I, as I told you, is very, uh, is coming from the vintages more than the location. Obviously, this is also uh, even a separate topic in itself, which we could yes, talk a yes, lot about. Yes, and, yes, and, uh, yes, yes. Thank you and, we, and we have still to work on that because uh, every year we learn from uh, from what we, we study. So, so I'm not uh, I'm not totally uh, uh, you know uh, sure of uh, of that. This is just uh, my uh, six or seven years of uh, of studying that issue. But that's not a lot. <laughs> so. Oh, I mean, we all we have to. And it's my intuition or so. But <laughs> there's always somewhere to to start when it comes to yes, research, and yes, we'll always yes. learn more about it. But a great question from uh, Richard Wapstra. So uh, I hope that uh, at least gave you some more some more insight. I have another question here for uh, Julia. Um, can we expect new appellations in the next few years in Cahors? Um, AOPs that will identify and protect these terroirs that you presented today. Uh, there, there are uh, projects uh, to classify the Appellation Cahor in uh, Grand Cru, like uh, in uh, Bordeaux for the Grand Cru classing. The classification will be uh, the same than in uh, Burgundy uh, vineyards. Uh, therefore, the Appellation Cahor Regional, then the Appellation Cahor Village, for example, with uh, terroir uh, from uh, limestone, for example, Pierre Blanche. Then another will be uh, Premier Cru, uh, for example, in the Château de Chambert, which is located in the coast of uh, Cahors. The village is uh, Floresas, and Floresas will be a Premier Cru uh, classé from the Cahors appellation. So this it's is all kind of motion? Yes, it's in progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it will come uh, within uh, seven or uh, eight uh, years. Ah, it okay. Makes, uh, many so times. It's, it's always good to have a, a time frame um, for, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, seeing all these appellations form, it's super interesting. And I, I hope that uh, more areas mm -hmm. will be able to expand even more when it comes to appellations and putting restrictions and rules for their wine so that they can actually be proud mm -hmm. to say that this is our wines and no one can, can do anything different than this. Um, we have more questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, we have a question for Lucy. Um, can we expect new appellations in the next few years? In oh, that was the one we just had. Uh, Lucy, is planting more Merlot and removing Cabernet Sauvignon in a general trend in the northern part of Madoc, or is it specific to Patache d'Or with its limestone stone soil? Uh, no, in, in general, in maybe uh, we remove Merlot to plant Cabernet Sauvignon because of the uh, climatic changements, but uh, it's maybe specifically uh, to Patage d'eau. Maybe 
other neighbors do the same thing. Um, why it's different? Uh, I, I explained um, before, maybe. Um, before people wait to drink the bottle and we produce a wine uh, with a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, which sometimes didn't have the best maturity for the tannins. But when you let a bottle 10 years uh, before drinking, as the tannins uh, come round and uh, the, the, you, you can keep a, a long because of the tannins is not very, um, uh, very perfect and the, the acidity is high. Now people don't wait to drink a bottle. So we need to have a better maturity. So today uh, in the north most past of Medoc, we always have sometimes problem of maturity of Cabernet Sauvignon. So we change for the Merlot, but it's very specific. Maybe in 30 years or 40 years, people, uh, which uh, the people will, will be at uh, in the same well, the, the place uh, in, Patou, in Chateau Patage uh, will say uh, she was crazy. She uh, don't have to do that. But now to produce uh, uh, maybe a wine adapted to the consumer. We need to change a little bit, not in the same sense uh, than the other. Well, I mean, uh, you might say that, or you might uh, be the pioneer from this one day, <laughs> Lucy. Uh, you might be a legend. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much to uh, Mathilde Berois who had that uh, question and also to um, Erwin uh, de Flint um, who had the question about minerality. And uh, now we have a last question here uh, to Edouard. Uh, question from uh, Fabrice uh, Deligne. Um, do you think that this approach with the spotlight on the Grenache grape could eventually push aside the other grapes from the AOP patrimony? No, 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 no. Uh, and this was not the aim. The, the, we need all these grape varieties and the diversity of these grape varieties. Uh, this is the, the, the history of Chateau de Dupap. And a few years ago, some organism in AO in France just tried. Oh, you froze there, uh, Edouard? Edouard, we cannot hear you. Somebody could finish the response. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's actually a limited time slot for everyone and Edouard has already used his. So uh, <laughs> no, let's hope you get back with us um, uh, very soon, uh, Edouard. Um, I think that uh, we'll have to leave it since we can't hear Edouard anymore. But a huge thank you to all the listeners and uh, to, of course, uh, all of you uh, winemakers, uh, Lucy, uh, Julien, Mathieu and Edouard. Um, and uh, well, I'd like to invite you already for our next webinar next Monday. Um, same time, same place on the Facebook page of Advini Quebec and also the recording of this session will be put on the YouTube channel of Advini. Um, Diffusion, the Advini Diffusion YouTube channel. Next week, we'll be discussing the theme of organic uh, viticulture, but not only. Um, sustainability through an holistic approach and focus on how different regions, such as the Roussillon, uh, Bourgogne, and Stellenbosch regions in South Africa, uh, the realities are different, obviously, in each region and country. And each domain uh, acts according to empirical observations made in its vineyard. A pragmatic and comprehensive approach archaeologically complements existing organic regulations and uses environmental observation to rethink practices by adapting to the environment and to the work phase, so workforce. So hopefully you will join us next week as well. Uh, we will have new winemakers from the uh, Advini group and uh, thank you all for listening. So enjoy your Monday evening. I'm hoping that you all have a nice glass of, I think you will say red wine today, right? <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye.
Bye.